So welcome to this webinar series where we will be presenting the EU funded project after the violence, children's rights in women's shelters. My name is Nathalie Söderlin and I work as an analyst at Bona Frid at Linköpings University in Sweden. And I will be your moderator through three webinars during October. And during these three webinars, we will present the AVEC project. And today I will also be one of the key speakers. This along with Sara Skog from Save the Children, Sweden. And we will start up with some housekeeping. So make sure that you are muted during the presentations. And there will be a recording. So if you speak, make sure you want to be seen or not. And you can also change your name just uh, in your picture and press the, the different dots and then you can rename yourself. And after each presentation, we will have a Q&A session. So you can either write down your questions in the chat or unmute at the end of each presentation if you have any questions and we will take every question later on. And we think that, is, that it's so much fun to see where you all are from. So to start up, if you like, uh, we would be really happy if you could share with us your name and profession and uh, or uh, organization and where, which country you are from. And you can write down just in the chat. Um, so today's webinar is the AVEC project and the first piece of the puzzle. So for today's agenda, I'm going to start up with talking a little bit about sheltered housing and children's rights and what we have seen in the project and then give you an overall picture of the model that we have created. And we will end with a Q&A after my presentation. And after that, we will have a break. And after the break, Sara Skog will present the first puzzle piece, Trauma-Informed Care, and talk about the three pillars of transforming care and a little bit about what is trauma, etc. And after that, we will have also a Q and A. Uh, I would also like to um, give a little tip that we are hosting two more webinars during October. So we will have one more already on Thursday this week, and it will be about children's right, rights to participate, play and develop at women's shelters. And the speakers are Lisa Ekström from Save the Children and Åsa Lundskog Mattsson from the Children's Welfare Foundation. And on the 18th of October, Linda Johansson and Katarina Bernsson will speak about the child rights approach at the women's shelters. And this project is uh, co-founded by the Rights, Equality and Citizenship Program of the European Union. And it's a collaboration between Save the Children, Children's Welfare Foundation, Marie-Cia de Schöld's University, Gothenburg City Mission, and Bona Frid. Um, but first, I'm going to start up with an introduction of the topic and how this project came to be. So women's shelters can be assigned to people who have been victims of domestic violence and need somewhere to go, often urgently. It's a form of temporary assisted living by staff trained to conduct conversations and activities, as well as other methods for helping victims of violence. In Sweden, it's the social services that investigate whether a woman gets sheltered. 
but no one has to wait for an investigation to receive an emergency placement. In emergency cases, the police can help a woman quickly to find an emergency accommodation, for example, a woman's shelter. The case is then handed to the social services and an investigation starts. And often women also brings their children to the shelter. So the staff therefore also need to have good knowledge of child psychology and strategies for how to best help a child through this period in life. <clears throat> and it's also important to speak about a child rights perspective when we talk about children at women's shelters. And with a child rights perspective, it's a matter of children's and adolescents' own contributions to the development of society, as well as of adults' will and ability to protect children and adolescents. This perspective is important to have in mind when talking about children at shelters, because they also have rights that should be met according to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child has been Swedish law since 1st January in 2020. The Convention on the Rights of the Child consists of 54 articles, but has four basic principles. That all children are equally valuable and should be treated with non-discrimination. That in every situation, the child's best interest must come in first hand. And that, that, that every child has the right to survive and develop, and also to the right to express their own views. But when it comes to children at women's shelters, it's important that other articles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child also are met. That all children um, are protected from all forms of physical or psychological violence, injury, or other abuse. They also have the right to the best possible health, the right to rehabilitation and social reintegration. But children also have other rights such as the right, right to play, rest and leisure, as, as well as the right to education and, and to go to school. All of these articles and, and a lot of the articles are important to accommodate when a child is placed at a woman's shelter, where the state has a responsibility to remedy these rights, where professionals around the child need to have different uh, tools in order to, to follow the Convention on the Rights of the Child, where they need to use their re resources to enable this when it comes to uh, legislation, collaboration, strategies, and routines for children to have these rights fulfilled. Because uh, children at shelters are right holders. So how are children's rights met in Sweden? In 2016, our government handed out an assignment to propose measures to strengthen children's rights for children who stay at shelters together with their parents. This was presented in 2017, which, which now has been supplemented in 2022. And the Legislative Council referral is called a window of opportunity, strengthening rights for children and adults in sheltered housing. But the proposals in this refer referral have not yet been impl implemented. Um, but the, the thought is that the, it will be uh, a part of Swedish law in 2023. And the reason why this happened, why this assignment uh, came to be was that a lot of actors saw that the rights of the child were not being met in many areas, that there were many shortcomings. Um, one thing is that the child is only seen as accompanied to the parent, often the mother, which means 
that social services don't have to open up an investigation for the child in order to make sure that the child gets support and treatment. So the focus has for a long time at shelters been on the mother at the shelter. But they also saw that preschool and schooling often suffers when a child is placed at a women's shelter. Um, and they also saw that, uh, that there is a lack of information directed to the children, such as why they are at the shelter, what happens during and after their stay there, and to lay that responsibility, responsibility to, uh, on the child's parent is often tough. Since the parent, it's, it, they themselves often has their own trauma. So there need to be professionals around the, the child who can, can give that information. And with that, it's important that professionals have, have knowledge about how to do that. Um, they also saw that it's often that many children are forced to interact with the often abusive parent against the child's will. And another part is that children at women's shelter often become very passive that because that there is not that much to do there since the accommodation often are made for adults. And they also saw that when you leave a woman's shelter, there is often a lack of safe environment and a stable housing. And these are some of the shortcomings that is presented in this referral. And many of these objectives is also seen in our survey that we did during 21 to 2022, where shelter staff answered a questionnaire about gaps in the protection area surrounding children at shelters. So these shortcomings are not a surprise for any of us in this project, um, since these are something that a lot of child rights organizations, such as Save the Children, has seen during decades. Um, and how many children are at shelters? Well, we, we, we do not know that exactly. We don't have an exact number for that right now. What we know is from a study that was conducted between 2018 to 2019. And that was that 6,200 children in Sweden stayed at least one night in a shelter. So that's a very high number. But we need more numbers in, in to, to show how many there are right now. What this study also showed is that approximately half of Sweden's municipalities lack a women's shelters. Um, so the past two years in this project, we have developed, tested and soon evaluated a model for professionals around children at women's shelters. We have offered trainees uh, to shelter staff in, in trauma-informed care and in good dia dialogues, including a training of trainees aimed at staff in shelters. This along with uh, special training aimed at social workers. We have also given psychosocial support for children through structured and free play with trained volunteers. We have also mapped gaps in the system. And now during this autumn, we will have an information campaign, advocacy campaign, aimed at decision makers at local, regional, and national and EU level. And we have also presented the project through dissemination of knowledge through lectures and, uh, and different webinars, such as this one. So what have we seen? Uh, Bona Free together with uh, Save the Children did between 2021 to 2022 a survey where we asked shelter staff at five women's shelters um, two different questions. So the first questions, question was, what have you seen recently that violates, violates children's rights? 
The other question was, which areas is important for decision makers to get knowledge about when it comes to children at sheltered housing? And during this period, we got in 91 answers that we analyzed through qualitative uh, content analysis. So I will now briefly go through the different themes that was emerge. And what we saw was a lack uh, due to visitation rights, the right to schooling, the right to care and treatment, and the right to a stable house. So I will just give some examples of what the shelter staff answered in this survey. So the first theme is about visitation rights. Because when a child is placed together with a parent at a shelter, the issue of contact between the child and the other parent outside the shelter often becomes complicated, especially if the parent who lives in the shelter has sought protection from the other parent with whom the child is to have contact with. In this theme, it emerged how the staff see difficulties in maintaining this interaction when placed in shelter, and that they questioning why this need to happen during the stay. So this is a big problem when also the child explicitly states that they don't want to see the other parents. <clears throat> the staff also answers that they see a need for strengthen routines and increase resources in the social services so that visits with the other parent can take place under more protected forms. And that contact shouldn't be done because it looks good for an upcoming custody hearing. Um, the second theme is about the right to schooling. And to be able to attend preschool and school is from research found to be an important protective factor for children, since that in school, the child is given the opportunity to develop, reach knowledge goals, interact and build relationships with other adults and children. So in this theme, however, it is highlighted by the staff that the right to school when placed in shelter is often lacking. Children living in Sweden are obliged to attend school with the right to a free basic education. The staff's responses shows examples of children in shelters being deprived of that right in various ways. In practice, the right to schooling can be lost for several months due to the fact that the parent outside the shelter has the right to pick up the child after school while the parties have continued sh shared custody. In the event of a change of the school, both guardians also need to give their consent, which further complicates the situation for the children. And one of the staff response in the survey is that on one occasion, the principal of the school denied schooling because of threats and the child's mental condition. So this is also a big problem when, when children's rights aren't met and through schooling, which can bring a lot of negative health effects if, if we don't give children that opportunity. Um, the third theme is about the right to care and treatment. And children in shelters have, have rights to care and treatment. And in this theme, shortcomings uh, in care emerge due to long processing times at the social services and that there is a focus on the parents problem where the child's need for care support and treatment is not always prioritized. When a child is placed at a woman's shelters it is required that measures regarding support and treatment are put in place. However the staff highlights long processing times sometimes of several weeks. 
weeks before the family has been assigned a child administrator by the social services. And this goes against the social services legislation in Sweden, as it clearly states that social services must without delay initiate an investigation if there is knowledge and information that may cause the need for intervention. It is also goes against the social services responsibility to ensure that victims of violence have their needs for support and met both urgently and in long term, um, which becomes difficult if it takes too long time before a child administrator is assigned. Um, the staff also describes the picture of how the child is often seen as an appendage that accompanies the mother, that they don't have uh, their own documentation obligation unless they have received a special assignment about this from the social services. They also believe that social services seem to have a greater focus on the parents' well-being rather than the child's need for support. The staff highlights the importance of the child in sheltered housing, that they should receive their own support when they are moved to a shelter, um, as it is currently just seen as accompanied to the parent who is placed. If the child is given their own support, the child's stay can be quality assured and a better follow-up on how they are doing and feeling in connection with the placement and also after they stay there, because it's important that we also follow up um, due to the child's uh, mental well-being uh, also after their stay at the shelter. And the fourth theme is about the right to a stable housing. And a safe and secure home is important for children. Children's right to a safe home after their time in a shelter is described in the following theme as problematic as there are difficulties in obtaining permanent housing solutions in Sweden. Shelter staff describes that many of the children end up homeless after their stay at the shelter. This is despite the importance of permanently safe housing. The children and their parents do not always get the help from social services that they need. And social services are, are in Sweden responsible for providing suitable housing to victims of violence if, if it is um, necessary. And the staff also highlights that many women and children stay too long at the shelter as the problem with finding a permanent place to live. And this often leads to that the women and children moving out of the sheltered, sheltered without having a permanent residence. And the staff emphasizes the importance that children should not have to move around between different temporary housings and especially children who often have been victimized of, of violence. Um, so what do we recommend? We see a need to strengthen the protection of children during uh, visitation. We also see the need to strengthen routines for children's contacts between social services and women's shelters, that there has to be routines for safe and stable living after the time in shelters. And we have to make sure that a safe schooling for children is in place when, when, when they are at a sheltered accommodation. We also see need for a strengthened collaboration between the mu municipalities social services, school and preschool, and the shelter. And we also need uh, an increase, increased knowledge among professionals regarding violence and legislation to ensure that, that children's rights are met. So we were several organizations 
that came together with an idea to build a model to ensure that children's rights at shelters are met. Um, so we, our aim through this project is to ensure with a child rights based approach that children is protected, gets to participate and have support during their stay at a women's shelter. And through this model, we have different target groups. They are children who live or have recently lived at a women's shelter. We also have um, professionals as a target group uh, that meets children at sheltered housing such as shelter staff, but also social workers. We, all, we also aim to target decision makers in Sweden and, and uh, outside Sweden, as, along with politicians. And we are doing this through our uh, advocacy campaign that is run by Save the Children. And we also aim to target, to some extent, the general public. And uh, I will now uh, present a short film uh, where we, where you will get an overall picture of the model that we have have made to ensure a child rights perspective at women's shelter. The movie is in Swedish, but we have a, a subtitle in in English. Varje år är tusentals barn i Sverige på flykt från våld i hemmet och tvingas bo på ett skyddat boende. Barn som utsätts för våld eller bevittnar våld i hemmet påverkas på olika sätt, både på kort och lång sikt. De har större risk att utveckla psykisk ohälsa, få problem i relationer och svårigheter i skolan. Därför är det viktigt att se till att barnet som vistas i ett skyddat boende får sina rättigheter tillgodosedda. Vi har tagit fram en modell för det. Modellen kallas för pusslet. För att kunna agera utifrån barnets bästa behöver den som möter barn på skyddade boenden kunskap. Därför ramas modellen in av kunskap om våld och vilar på några särskilt utvalda artiklar från barnkonventionen. Den första pusselbiten i modellen vilar på barnkonventionens artikel 24 om att alla barn har rätt att få vård och rehabilitering när de inte mår bra. Pusselbiten kallas för traumamedveten omsorg. Med den får boendepersonal utbildning i traumakunskap för att kunna möta barnets behov på ett bättre sätt. Den andra pusselbiten utgår ifrån barnkonventionens artikel 12 om att barn har rätt att säga hur de vill ha det. Vuxna ska lyssna på barn. Pusselbiten kallas för information och delaktighet. Med denna pusselbit får boendepersonal utbildning i bra samtal för att lära sig hur de ska gå tillväga när de ska prata med barn om deras behov av information och stöd. Den tredje pusselbiten placeras på barnkonventionens artikel 3 som handlar om barnets bästa. Pusselbiten kallas för barncentrerad samverkan. Den innebär att alla hjälpare i kontakt med familjen arbetar enligt en samverkansmodell för att barn ska få sina rättigheter tillgodosedda. Den fjärde pusselbiten vilar på barnkonventionens artikel 19 som handlar om att skydda barn mot våld. Pusselbiten kallas för våldsmedveten handläggning. I den får socialsekreterare som arbetar med barn och föräldrar på skyddat boende utbildning för att öka deras kunskap om våld. Då kan de förstå bättre och sätta in rätt insatser. Nu har vi kommit till den sista och femte pusselbiten som vilar på artikel 31 om barns rätt till lek, vila och fritid. Denna pusselbit kallas för lek och aktivitet. I denna utbildas volontärer i att erbjuda strukturerade aktiviteter för barn och unga på de skyddade boendena. Modellen visar på vikten av att ha alla pusselbitar på plats. Genom att lägga hela pusslet kan vi lättare tillgodose barns rättigheter under deras vistelse på skyddat boende. Med projektet Efter våldet vill vi säkerställa barnens rätt till traumamedveten omsorg, information och delaktighet genom barncentrerad samverkan, våldsmedveten handläggning 
samt lek och aktivitet. Projektet är ett samarbete mellan Rädda barnen, Stiftelsen Allmänna barnhuset, Marie Sedersköld högskola, Göteborgs kyrkliga stadsmission och Barnafrid och är finansierat av Europeiska unionens program för rättigheter, jämlikhet och medborgarskap. So that was just a short introduction to our model, the puzzle. And uh, as you could see, the, the model is, is a form of a puzzle because we see the, the importance to make sure that, um, that every, every puzzle piece are equally important when, when talking about children at shelters. And during this webinar series, you will get deep and deep and knowledge about our different puzzle pieces. So after the break, Sara will present uh, about the first puzzle piece, trauma-informed care. And on Thursday, my colleagues will present the puzzle pieces, participation and information, along with the puzzle piece play and activity. And lastly, on the 18th of October, you will get an introduction to child-centered cooperation along with the puzzle piece violence conscious handling. So before we take a little break, it's time for a short Q&A session. So I will start with uh, my sharing of my screen. So if anyone has a question, please feel free to, to speak up. Otherwise, I think Sara is going to help me with the, with the questions if they have come up any in the chat. Yes, it, we actually got a question here. And it was, did you involve children in developing the model? Uh, to start up, when we first uh, started with this project, actually Save the Children did an, uh, um, was it workshops? Or they, they spoke to both shelter staff and children and uh, to, to listen to them about what they have heard and what they needed. So um, one of those things was that they felt that they wasn't listened to. They wanted to participate more and also uh, those important factors of the, the ability to, to have the opportunity to play uh, was important factors. Was it anything else, Sara? No, that was actually all about it. And then we also saw when we were, you know, seeing the children and the staff at the centers, we also saw that there were other pieces that we needed to, to put together so the children could get the best help that they needed. So, yeah, it came from like, you know, uh, some work before and then now we tried it together. Yeah. Okay, I think we got one uh, other question here and it's, uh, do shelters have safeguarding policies? Um, that's actually one of, I mentioned the, the referral in the beginning of this presentation, and uh, that is one of the proposals in that referral that it should be, have more uh, quality proven, because now we don't have that at shelters in Sweden today. So the, the, they propose that it should be um, more measures to be able to even start up a shelter. Um, yeah. So hopefully <laughs> next year there will be more uh, policies um, regarding this, such as um, the ability to to um, to take out um, brottsregister, crime registration, crime records, records. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we need to, to do something. Uh, there are a lot of stuff that needed to be done. So hopefully we, we get it forward in Sweden as well. And there is another question here. Is the model suitable for all European countries? Um, to, to start up with, it's, it's formed from, for, for 
the Swedish system, but our goal is to actually uh, present the model so it would work in other countries, but then we have to 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 start up focus group with other countries as well, so we can um, make sure that it fits uh, more countries, but and that's a huge, huge uh, job to do. And I also think like some pieces of the puzzle can usually like, you know, you can probably take that just in place, like trauma informed care that a little bit easier because that's just like an education, and like information about trauma and how it affects children and stuff. And we're going to talk about it later on. Uh, but it's true, as you said, Natalie, it, it will, you know, be more work with that. And we also have another question here. Where can we find more information about the project and the model? Yeah. And we have a website um, that is located at banafrid.se. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I actually have a, a code. So you can just pick up your phone and, and take a picture of that and you will enter the website. Um, and we can, I can probably also add it to the chat during the break so you can uh, visit the website right away and follow the project because we will have a lot of reports uh, that will be uh, produced now during the this autumn and winter and all of the materials will be able to to see at the website and and all of our organization's websites yeah and there will also be some movies that we have done uh that um, the staff at the shelters are talking about how they thought about uh, the different pieces uh, and like what they got. Like, so what do they feel about getting trauma informed care? What do they feel about having this, you know, uh, play and activities and stuff? So, so there will also be some films there and we will translate them uh, or we will subscribe them. Yeah, <laughs> so, so all, them. All, all, the, all the films that are conducted will be with an English subtitles. And, sure. Uh, we great. also got another question here. What are your plans for the future sustainability of the model advocacy uh, strategy? Yeah, um, it's important that because the, the this is a EU founded project, so it's it's finished during January next year. But we will continue with the spreading of the model after the ending of the project and the ending of the founding. And this is questions that we found is it's very important to still be um, to make feel we have to make people be aware of these different questions. So it's an ongoing uh, model. But one thing that's really good about this project is that all like the educations that we have and the volunteering that we have, that will go on after the project is uh, finished because they are already, we are already doing that. For example, in Save the Children, we, all, we have these uh, educations in trauma-informed care and the other organizations also had these educations, for example. So they will just um, go on. So if there are, uh, Women shelters who want to have these pieces, they can just contact the different organizations. It's like, yeah, we want to have a, a education about this, or we will have like volunteering here. Can you? Is it possible to do it on our shelters? So actually, the model will kind of like live after uh, this project has ended, and that's I think one of it's a really really good thing about this project. Yeah, and uh, and uh, as I said before. Um, and the Children's um, Welfare Foundation is training trainees so that they in, in their region, they can still uh, train others in, in, uh, in good dialogues, for example, that will be more presented on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Are there any more questions? But one, one strength also in this project is like we are five really strong organizations that got together and we are, all of us are working with domestic violence uh, in different ways. So we've got a, a good uh, match together that we help each other on this topic. Yes. But if there isn't any more questions right now, we will have one more Q&A session. 
uh, after Sara's uh, presentation. So if you have any other questions regarding the model as a whole, you can take that one uh, then as well. Um, otherwise, I think it's time for a short break. So welcome back. Hope that you all had a nice coffee break. I will now start with presenting Sara Skog. She is a psychotherapist and works at Save the Children Sweden. And she is going to present the first piece of the puzzle, Trauma-Informed Care. So over to you, Sara. Thank you, Nelly. And uh, yeah, as you said, I've been, I'm working at Save the Children. Uh, I work at the center and Save the Children who uh, meets abused children in therapy. So I work with trauma therapy uh, half of my time and then half of the time I, I do different stuff like educate and, and stuff. So I think you can take on the next picture. And in this project, uh, Save the Children are having one piece of the puzzle that's called trauma-informed care, care. And we said like three pillars of transforming care. Uh, it's kind of like, how do we create a context for healing uh, to help the children heal in the best way? Uh, and we, need, we know that some of the children uh, need therapy, but we know a lot of the healing can take place in just the environment around the kids. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And when we have given this uh, piece uh, of education to the shelter staffs, it has been like a two days education. So you will get like a, a really quick, um, kind of like quick information today about what the education is about. Uh, but when we have been giving it, it's like two days education. And then also the shelters have been having supervision. Like, so they've been supervised uh, at eight different uh, times during a period of one and a half a year to kind of like make the uh, like you know the knowledge really so that it sits on the uh, so the staff knows uh, how they're going to react and act against the children so it's been a, a kind of like a long term where we have been trying this with the shelters and the shelters have been really really happy about it so I hope you will today get a little bit clue what it is about so I think you can take the the next uh, picture. Natalie is helping me with, with pictures, so that's good. So uh, I will talk today about what the three pillars of transforming care is about. Uh, and you will see a short, you will see a little bit, a movie uh, that will uh, explain a little bit more. But first we know like a lot of the kids who comes to the shelters, they have been experienced a lot of uh, different difficulties. They have been, was, uh, been seeing the violence at home and they have been hearing the violence and a lot of them have been traumatized. Um, so we need to, to understand what these uh, children are having in their uh, uh, backpack when they come to the shelters. And if we can understand that a little bit more, then it's so much easier for us to, to help them. Uh, so this model is, is kind of like the base is that we need to understand how trauma affects children and how it affects their thoughts and how it affects their behavior. And then there are three pillars that we know through science about trauma that we need to work at to, to help the, the children to, to heal and get better. And the first pillar there is to, to create safety. How do we get the children to feel safe again? Because we know when you experience a lot of these traumatizing experiences, it's hard to feel safe. So we need to, to make them feel safe again. And the other pillar is uh, we need to streng strengthen their relations because we know a lot of the kids have problems with the relations. They have uh, you know, a hard time to, to kind of like trust adults again. And also that we know that a lot of these children have uh, difficulties in the relations with other peers and stuff. So we need to help them to create uh, good relations with other people. And we also need them to help to cope with the emotions and the thoughts that usually comes after uh, a trauma. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how the trauma affects uh, children. And then I will talk a little bit uh, about the three different pillars. So hopefully you get a little bit clue what this model is about that we have been uh, educated uh, the, the staff in. 
but I, I, I will say it again, you will get like the short, short, really, really short version. And where we, we do this education, it's two, day, two days education. But we can take the next picture. I actually saw in the beginning when you came into this uh, uh, webinar, I saw there was one person from Australia. And that's actually, it's really interesting because this model actually comes from a man who are working in Australia. He's an Australian man. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Howard Bath, and he's a psychologist. And he has put this model together with his colleague, Diane Boswell, who, who's also a psychologist. And he has been kind of like scanning through like the uh, science uh, researchers uh, about trauma. Like what, what do we know about the trauma field? And what do we, can we see like this, some, some clues that we need to think about when we meet these children? That, because there's so much we can do around these children to help them heal again. So he has been going through all this researches and he has kind of like put this model together to make it so much easier for, for people who works around these children to act in a good way so we can help them uh, in a better way. And as I said before, we know some of the children at the shelters need therapy because their, their problems are so hard. So they need to come to a psychotherapist or a psycho uh, psychologist to, to get more help. But a, a lot of them, a lot of the children can heal if they just get the right help in the environment. And that's what this model is about. It's not about therapy. It's, it's more about how can we, uh, who are around these people, help the kids to heal in the best way. So he talks about, uh, Howard Bott talks about the other 23 hours, like the other 23 hours when the kids are not going to therapy, because usually therapy is just like one hour a week. And we know that's just too less, too little to help these children. And he says like healing relationships need not always involve psychotherapy. Many people recover from trauma exposure in the context of family, friendships and other relationships. And we know that, and I've been working with therapy for these kids for 13 years or actually more than that before I started at Save the Children. And I know like we can do so much for these kids uh, if we like, you know, helping each other around and helping the kids in the, in the environment. And I would sometimes say that it, this is actually more important than therapy to help the, the children heal. So this is uh, really good when we can talk about this and see what we can do. Yeah. So I will start showing you a little bit, um, a little film that actually Howard Bath is, is talking about the model and who, what it's about. So he, he talks in English because he's from Australia and uh, then also it's translated in Swedish. So you will get in the different way this time. The subtitle in, in Swedish. And my name is Howard Bath and um, I'm a psychologist by training and have worked most of my life in child protection services, but also in youth justice and mental health services around Australia, but I also did my training originally over in the USA. The Three Pillars Framework is a way of framing the very large literature on early childhood trauma. It's a way of trying to make sense of all those research findings that help us understand what has happened to these young people and how that's affected their lives. It also helps us understand how we work with these young people to bring about growth and healing. There's a very large research literature about working with kids who have been exposed to adversity and trauma. The problem is that it's such a large and complex body of work that it doesn't make a lot of sense for people who are actually working with these young people. The Three Pillars attempts to reduce this complex body of work into three clear propositions that make sense to those who are working with these young people. A lot of the literature in the field is directed at clinicians and psychotherapists. The Three Pillars program is specifically designed for those who spend a lot of time with young people but aren't necessarily clinicians or therapists. These are people like parents, natural parents, like foster parents, like hostel workers, like teachers, like sporting coaches, who aren't specifically trained to work as therapists, but nevertheless spend a lot of time with these young people and are in the best position to provide support and healing. What we're aiming for with the three pillars 
is the creation of an environment that promotes growth and healing. That's an environment in which the child feels safe, that they feel able to relax and to let down their guard and get on with life. The second thing we're looking for is that they're able to connect with the people they're working with and living with. That might mean the adults that are providing support, but it also means the peers that they're with, because everyone needs a supportive social environment to grow and heal. The third thing we're looking for is that the young people feel that they're able to cope. They're able to cope with their external circumstances, but they're also able to cope with the emotions and their inner turbulence that so many of these young people have a hard time coping with. That was Howard Barth telling more about what trauma from care is about. So what he's saying here is that we are not, this is not for therapists or psychologists. This is for the people who are around these children, like parents, like counselors, like teachers and coaches uh, and direct care workers, case managers, and all the people who are in position to help a child heal. This is what like trauma from care is about. Uh, because if we all work in the same way, we can do so much for these kids. And I've been supervising a lot of groups who have been working with this model. And it's so fantastic to see sometimes how fast they can get through like to the, to the kids and see so many different like fast changes in the behaviors. Uh, I came actually to one group uh, that I've been working with. And after three weeks, when I, I came the next time, they told me like, this is a new child. What, what happened? We don't understand it. It changed so, so fast in, in her behavior. But they have been working with a lot of like giving the child positive uh, comments. And they were there kind of like all, all uh, they were just seeing the, the, the child all the time and were helping the sh uh, child in the, like in the same way. And that got such a big differences for this child. So it can be really, really strong when we go together and do it in the right, and like in the same way. So, okay, we can do, do the next slide. So I will talk first about like the base uh, of this model. Like I said before, we need to know a little bit more how about trauma affects a child. And when we know that, then it's more easily for us to, to help the child in the best way. So what is a trauma? Uh, Bruce Perry uh, is uh, one person who has been working a lot with trauma and a lot, doing a lot of researches in this area. And he says uh, a trauma is a psychologically distressing event that is outside the range of a usual human experience, often involving a sense of intense fear, terror, or helplessness. Helplessness, and this is what I, I think. What is it is about is that when you experience something that is so hard to cope with, then like the the body can't can't you know uh, act in the way that it's used to, so you feel so exposed to this, and we don't know what what is a trauma for you and for me because it's it's so different because we have different backpacks with us. So so one situation can be trauma. A trauma for me, but it doesn't be need to be a trauma for Natalie, for example. So it's a really individual. What a what kind of differences that affects us. So I, I take the next slide. So we know that there are several uh, differences that kind of like affects us when we are experiencing a, a difficult situation, like a potential traumatic event. And we know that there are factors that affect us. Uh, so if we become more traumatic, like if the situation become more traumatic or not, we know that uh, it depends on the personality that we have. And of course, in the children, it also depends on the age. If we have a small child who experienced traumatic events or if they are older, because when they are older, they usually can kind of like get more information that they can understand it more because the cognitive uh, uh, part of the brain have been more developed. And we know also uh, it affects how much you are exposed to the, to the traumatic event and how it affects you. If you are really, really close and you are there when it happens, or if you're just kind of like in the uh, long, long way from it, and then of course it affects you how you how you will uh, act on the, on the situation. Uh, 
And it also affects the, the self-efficacy because if you're, for example, if you are raped and you, if you feel like, yeah, it was my fault because I, I wore these clothes and everything, then the, the situation is, is harder to, to cope with. For example, and we know also like the social support is really, really important. Uh, how you can cope with this event. Um, if you get social support and help, we know uh, the children heal easily, easier, better. And we can also say that there are different kinds of factors that we know also that uh, affects and we have risk factors, of course, that I think and, uh, a lot of you knows about. Uh, like intelligence and if they go to school and stuff, uh, that's, that's protective um, factors that will help the, the children to, to cope with traumatic events better. And if the, the child has a lot of risk factors, uh, for example, like having parents who are not there, maybe they are, are abused as well, or like they are, uh, can't be there to help the kid, that's a risk factor to, to um, of, of course, uh, that you will feel less, uh, that you don't feel so good. And also about how, what the type and amount of the trauma, that uh, how much it is, of course, will also affect how the, the child will, will feel. So there are a lot of different factors that um, like kind of like um, they are, are affecting how the child uh, feels and how it they will go on with their life after the traumatic events. So I will go on to the next slide. And we know that, of course, when you're being experienced a trauma, uh, there will usually be trauma reactions. And for some children, they go away pretty fast because they got social support and they kind of like they know how to, to cope with this. But then we know uh, a lot of children, of course, who are staying at the uh, these shelters have a lot of trauma reactions and usually they have troubling with emotions and the mode states. They are easily, they easily get angry, for example, because they have like the body are so stressed. So um, they have really problem uh, about uh, coping with their emotions. And we also know that uh, a lot of them can kind of like they change his behavior. They can avoid stuff that uh, reminds them about the trauma. So like, yeah, I don't, I don't go near there because if I go near there, I will think about the trauma that I experienced or, or something like that. So they, the changes in the behavior. And we know a lot of the kids uh, got physical problems. They got problem with the stomach. They got problem with headaches and stuff because the stress in their body are so, so high. So it affects the whole system. And we also know like a lot of the kids have negative alterations in cognitions. So they think really negative about others. Like I can't rely on, on adults. I can't, I can't rely on, on anyone. I'm alone. I'm, I'm useless. Uh, I'm, I'm bad. Like they have like all these negative cognitions about themselves, for example. And, and they need help to cope with that. And a lot of them have trouble with hypervigilance. Hyper and there are tricky names here and tricky words. Um, so they are also, they're really tense in their bodies because like the whole system are tense and they kind of like, it's a, the, the body says we have to be uh, on alarm. If, it's, if there's something happen again, we need to cope with that. So they are so tense and they're so stressed in the body. So we need to help them to, to, um, to uh, handle these trauma reactions. And we can take the next slide. And the kids that we talk about this in this model, we usually say like they are complex traumatized because uh, the kids uh, who are, are, are uh, complex traumatized, they have been experienced a multiple chronic and prolonged developmentally adverse events most often in interpersonal nature and, and early onset. So uh, like in this case, when we meet these kids uh, in the shelters, we know that they have been experienced violence at home. Uh, and we know usually it's been going on for a long time uh, and it's been affecting them in a, a really hard way sometimes. And we know, of course, some, some kids uh, can handle it in a better way, uh, as I was talking as, about before and we know some of the kids are feeling really really bad so 
in this model, we usually talk about the complex trauma. It's not just you have been experienced one uh, traumatic event. So these kids usually have been uh, experienced a lot of traumatic events and they're seeing their, their, their mom being hit and, and stuff like that. So we can take the next slide. So what we do in this model is that usually people react on the child's behavior. And when you have been traumatized, uh, we know that these behaviors can be really tricky sometimes and they are kind of hard to understand and they could be provoke, provoking sometimes and challenging for adults around the kids. And usually when we just uh, see the, the child's behavior, uh, and we react on that behavior, we know it's usually not so, so good because usually these behaviors could be hard. So usually we can maybe like we get angry at the, uh, angry at the child or we say like, you have to get together now. We, we can't really see under what lies, lies under the, the water because this is like the iceberg metaphor. We just see the top when we see the behavior of the children and we need to see lower, like above the, the water. We, we need to see why, why are the children acting in this way? What have these children been through that makes them act in this behavior? What are these, uh, the children's emotions? What are they thinking? And what are the, the expectations of, of the others who are around them? So in, if we, we're going to help these children, we need to see under the water. We need to see the whole iceberg. We, our ice mountain, maybe <laughs> ice mountain is the better word. Um, we can't just react on the behavior because usually it, it's not helping the child then. Uh, because we know like a lot of these children have really um, provoking or, or challenges behavior sometimes. So, so we need to understand more about it. So we can go on to the next slide. So the trauma perspective here is not that we say what's wrong with you because there's so many people who meet these children with these sentences. They say like what's wrong with you? Can't you just get together? Why are you doing this way? You're always acting this way. You have to get better on in school or you have to whatever it is. But and if we say like that like what's wrong with you? We're not helping the kid. So instead, if we have trauma perspective, we, we will meet the kids with, what has happened to you? What have you been through that makes you, like, like, that makes you feel like this way? And like, you don't, you're like, how can I help you to, to act in a, another way that helps you more? Because when we understand what the, the child has been through, then we can easily, uh, better, in better way, help the child. So instead of just thinking what's wrong with the child, we need to understand what has this child been through that makes their behavior come up in this way. So we go to the next slide. So I will talk a little bit about the brain and its development to just understand. So now we are in the part that, that, like under, that we have like this trauma understanding. So I will do a really, really quick um, information about this, the, the brain, how, it affects the children when they are experiencing traumatizing events. So you can show the next um, slide. And this is of course really, really complex. I will say to you, like the brain is so complex. So this is like, we're, we're talking about this in like in a little bit easy way, uh, but it's, it's really important to understand. So we all have this stress response if we will see, for example, if it will jump out a tiger from on this computer now and roar and, and scream really loud when we are not like, uh, we don't think it will come up a tiger, all of us will probably, or, or most of us will probably re will react, like we, we will a little bit jump a little bit, like the heart will pump a little bit. And then like after seconds, we get more relaxed again because our stress response had been reacted and, and we had, also get, get it down because we know like this tiger will, won't come out of the computer. So if we will talk a little bit easy about it. So when we experience a, a, a traumatic event uh, or, or something that is scary for us, uh, we, will, we are in a situation that is scary. We have an alarm system in the brain. It's called amygdala. 
and it goes on really, really quick, like uh, one millisecond, it goes a, a, a signal to our stress system in the body. So the stress reaction will go on, should I fight or should I flee? And we are, we are not thinking, but this, this goes so fast. And, and then they go another signal to the hippocampus. That's our kind of like our memory bank. We have our memories and it will say like, have I been through this uh, situation before? Can I handle this? Or should I like stay or should I fight or should I flee? Uh, and then like if the hippocampus have like, yeah, you have been watching this computer several times, Sarah, the computers is not like, you know, you, it, it's not dangerous to watch a computer. And then also to go with signal to our pre prefrontal cortex where we can, uh, think more logical uh, and the prefrontal cortex says like yeah the computer is safe you have been watching uh, a lot of movies on the computers and like the tiger is it's not dangerous then our stress response will go down again so we will kind of like we will make it go down but when the kids uh, who are experienced uh, trauma and when they are exposed to this several times this amygdala system will get uh, more and more highly like the amygdala will go on all the time so small events that's not dangerous now maybe because they are living in a shelter for example uh, the stress system goes on even if it's not a dangerous situation because the amygdala kind of like make a signal like yeah something is happening here you need to be on your guard you have to to react on this even if it's a fake alarm so like the, the brain is kind of like working, like it's a fake alarm all the time for, for a lot of these kids. And these affects their behaviors because they, the, like the brain thinks like, I need to run now because there's something dangerous that's happening. So maybe if I am in school and something, I, I feel stressed, something happening that kind of reminds the brain of a traumatic event, the system will go on. And usually like sometimes the kids run off the, the school and runs home to kind of like seek uh, so, so they can uh, be safe again. And that's not, that's of course not good for the child uh, because these behaviors make the life really, really hard for them. So when we understand that this brain system uh, is a little bit different uh, when you're traumatized as a kid, then we can easily meet their needs and kind of like help them to, to cope with their feelings and, and, and thoughts and stuff uh, and kind of like make the stress system go down a little bit more. So these are kind of like some, some stuff that we talk about in this education to make uh, the staff uh, understand more how, how the brain works and why the behaviors uh, could be tricky sometimes and how they can meet their needs when the, the child is kind of like reacting on their amygdala system or like the, the stress response system. So we go on to the next slide. So if we kind of like summarize it, uh, trauma traumatized children usually have overly synthesized alarm system. The overly synthesized amygdala of traumatized young people loses the ability to discriminate between safety and danger. It falsely signals danger and hostility everywhere. So of course, if you think like the, uh, your, your brain al uh, always uh, have a signal like it's, it's dangerous to be around here. Of course, you will be tense and you will always like, you know, react in, in a way that's a little bit hard for the environment to understand. Like other people doesn't really understand why these kids are acting in this way. So this is good to remember. So we take the next slide. So now we're coming into the, the three pillars of transforming care just to to understand, like now we have been talking about the trauma understanding uh, in a really, really short, in a really, really easy way, because there's so much more we talk about uh, in this way, but it's, it's, you need to understand it. If you meet a child who are traumatized, the, the child will have different uh, kind of reactions because of what it's been experienced, of course. So now when we understand a little bit more why the child acts in, in a different way, uh, then we need to see how can we help the child with the, with the other pillars? How can we uh, create safety? And how can we uh, make them to connect with other people, as Howard said in the beginning? How can we strength, strengthen their relations with other people, both peers and, and adults and, and the parents and, and the, the people who are around them? And how can we help the, the children to cope with their emotions and the thoughts 
uh, that uh, reminds them about the trauma that they've been experiencing. So if you go to the first pillar, that's safety. So we take the next slide. So safety, we know that for a lot of researchers, that safety is, is really, really important for, for every people. And, you know, of course, like this Maslow, Bowlby, Erickson, like all these theory, theories and models who, who says like this safety is so important if people are going to feel good and, and connect with other people. So we need to feel safe. Otherwise, it's really, really hard to, to work as you're supposed to. And if we're talking about traumatized people, the primary concern is safety because usually they don't feel safe. And safety is such a, it's, it's much more bigger than just say like, okay, now you are safe on a women's shelter. Uh, the abusive parent can't come to you here. It's not just about physical safety. It's much more about uh, safety inside because uh, we can't know uh, how, the, how the children feel. So we need to talk about it. We need to help them to create safety. And in this model, we talk about four different ways of safety. You can take the next slide. We talk about physical safety. Of course, that, that's, uh, that's important. How can we, can we make the, the child feel physical safe? And even if they come to like a women's shelter, we need to talk about, okay, how can we create this room so the child feels safe? A lot of children that I have met, they kind of like in the beginning, they feel like I have to have my bed in, in this way, because then I can see the door. And if somebody comes in, I'm, I'm more, you know, I can see it easily. And that makes me feel more safe, for example. So we need to create an environment uh, like that's also physical safety in, in different ways, just not, uh, not like we just take them away from the, the violence at home, for example. But we also talk about emotional safety because a lot of these kids are not used to show their emotions because maybe they've been punished for showing their emotions and they become kind of like yeah, teased because they show their emotions. So we need to help them about creating a, an atmosphere like they can feel like I can talk about emotion. This is okay to feel sad here. It's, it's okay to be angry here uh, to make them feel safety. Like it, it's okay to show emotions here. So that's one uh, an important part of the safety. And the other one is uh, the relational safety. Uh, we need to kind of help them again to, to trust adults again, because a lot of the children that I meet, they don't trust adults because they have been experienced so much uh, hard um, with, with uh, adults. So they kind of like, uh, they don't trust people. So we need to create a relational safety with the kids that we meet. So for example, uh, if we don't know an answer on a question that like, a, a, maybe like a, a child has asked me a question, if I don't know the, the answer on that question, it's better to say to the child, you know what, I don't really know uh, the, the answer now, but as soon as I knew the answer, I would get back to you and say it, instead of making up stories about like, yeah, you, you will be safe or you, you whatever, because the child will feel like you're not telling the truth. And that's really tricky for the relational safety. If they feel like I can't trust these people, then I won't feel safe again. So we need to create a relational safety for these kids. And there's also of safety because a lot of the kids who come to, to shelters in, in Sweden, they come from different kinds of culture. They're not like maybe like born in Sweden, then maybe they are born in, in other countries. And we know like this cultural safety is a, a, a really important for us, for all of us, uh, because that's one part, it's our identity. So how can we like in the centers, how can we maybe like, uh, celebrate different traditions? Can we make some special food in this center? So they feel like, okay, now I, I like remember this bread that we usually bake in our, my home country, for example, to make like this cultural safety also feel, uh, feel good for them. So when we talk about safety, we talk more uh, uh, about this one. So uh, I will take the, the next slide. So as I said, like all these uh, children who have been experienced traumatizing events, trauma, uh, hard, hard situation, they have different kind of needs. And sometimes it's hard for us to react like in a good way, because if you see in some of the the pictures here, some of the child kind of like shows like a little bit like they kind of like angry 
and it doesn't appeal to us that we're going to take care of them because we kind of like it's like when you know emotions kind of like uh, we feel the other one's emotions so when a child is angry or acting out usually we get kind of like get angry together like, like angry at back at them like no you can't do this or we kind of like raising our voice or or whatever but we need to see like all all these uh our children who really need to meet, meet like with caring and understanding and and we will need to to help them to to feel safe again uh, in the best way so we take the next slide and the next pillar is the connections so as we said like relations and connections are really really important so the more healthy relationships a child has the more likely he will be recover from trauma and thrive and relationships are the agents of change so we know that the relationships and, and the connections are really, really important for a child to feel good and to heal again. So we need to, to see like, how can we help the, the child uh, get a better relationship, for example, for, for, with the mom? How can we help them in the shelter to create a good relationship again? Can they do like nice uh, activities together just to build back the relationship? Or how can we see how we can help the child uh, with peers and stuff to, to, uh, to work together with other children in a good way that we know that are healing and really, really important for the child. So connections is really important. And we talk about this uh, a lot in the, in the education. How can we help them to connect with other people in a good way? So I go on because I see the time runs really fast here. And as uh, we also say, like this essence of trauma is feeling God forsaken, cut off from human race, like we don't feel connected with, the, with the other people. So we need really to work with that connections with others to help the, people, uh, the children to heal, heal again and feel better again. I can take the next slide. And we also talk about resilience in this way, because we know in resilience, uh, as you probably know, the relationships are really important. We know like the key protective factors in the resilience is caring relationships, uh, that we are warm and that we are available for the kid, that we are kind and that we are trustful for the kid. That's a really, really big factor in creating resilience uh, with a child, in a child. And we also know like high expectations uh, that we think like, you can do this. I believe in you, you can fix this. That's also one key factor in resilience. And the, the last one is like the, the child feels like I can contribute to, to do stuff. Like I can, I can help you with that. And he can like, you know, be, feel like uh, he, uh, he can be able to, to help in a good way that he can feel responsible for different kind of things. That's also a factor of resilience. So we talk about this when we talk about uh, relations and connections. So we take the other slide. So this is the last slide about coping and the, the last pillar of coping, because we know a lot of these children that we meet in the centers, they have so much troubling uh, about handling their emotions, the thoughts and the experience that they've been through. So we need to help them. And we usually talk about two broad types. We're talking about coping with environment and external circumstances. And we also talk about coping with internal states, such as emotions and impulses. Uh, and when we can help them about this, and we, we can help them uh, to, to try to find strategies uh, that helps them feel better, then we really, really try to, to, to help them to, to get through the, the trauma and how it affects them. And usually the kids develop both conscious and unconscious strategies uh, to cope with the range of external challenges and like strong emotions, impulses. And those strategies usually maybe they worked when they lived in the family, maybe like if they uh, had an abusive parent, uh, this, these strategies maybe worked there. But then when they come to for like a shelter, it doesn't help them anymore. You can't run off when something gets hard or you can't just, uh, uh, run away or you can't just um, uh, burst out or like scream for example so we need to help them to cope better uh, with different kind of strategies so we talk about this as well when we talk about this coping uh, part in the pillar so i think we can take the the next one and when we're talking about this coping part 
we talk about we need to help the child to co-regulate because when we when they can't really do the regulation by themselves when they have high emotions we need to help them to to get uh, more relaxed again and when we uh, help children to co-regulate we usually say it's a little bit uh, some some stuff that we need to think about we need to focus on the child's emotion instead of our own emotions because as i said before this uh, behaviors can be really challenging and when a child maybe screams at you maybe it's easy to scream back but now we're not like seeing behind the the ice mountain we need to see what lies under there so we need to be calm and we need to to focus on the child's emotions okay now this child is really um like you know have a lot of emotions we need to help him or her in the best way so we need to be aware of our own emotions. That's really, really important to help the, the child in the best way. And we need to talk in a soothing, assertive tone to make it go down so the child feels more relaxed. Okay, this is not like something, some, uh, some uh, adult who, who, wants, um, who wants to be bad at me or, or uh, we need to be really calm and we need to absorb the child's hostility. And we need to support, uh, like see what, what does this child need? How can I help him feel better again? Like, what can I do? Should we sit down and take a, a cup of tea? Should we talk here? Or uh, should we go just outside to just take a walk? How can I, I meet uh, the child's needs? And the goal in co-regulation is to calm the child. How can we get the child down again so we can help him? And then when the, the child is calm again, then we can talk with the child again because when, uh, you have a child who's really, really emotional. You can't talk. You just need to act to, to get him down or her down again so you can help the child in a better way. And the more you do this, the more the brain learns how to, to regulate the emotions. So then after a while, usually the child can do it in his own way. But we need to co-regulate to help him cope. So that's what we talk about as well. And we can take the next one. And I think actually I'm in the end now uh, of my presentation. Because if we put this together, uh, like the pillars, how can we help them to feel safe again? How can we make them to connect with other people? And how can we help them to cope with these feelings and emotions? Then we will do a, such a big uh, job to help these kids to feel uh, better. And we have a, a quote from Maya Angelou who says, I may not remember what you said, I may not remember what you did, but I will always remember how you made me feel. And I think that's so important because it's so about us, so, so much about us, how we meet the children's needs and how we act on the children's behavior. And if we act in a kind and supporting way, the child will feel that immediately and remember that that was, a, that was an adult that I could trust. And that was an adult who met me in a nice way that makes me feel better. So we, we need to think about this when we're going to help these children. So I've been talking pretty fast and I've been going through uh, some stuff, but I just hope that you got a feeling for uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about um, trauma-informed care and the three pillar. So I think that's uh, all about this. So do you have any questions? Please uh, just write in, in the chat if you have any questions or uh, you can unmute and, and uh, just speak out. Um, but I think um, you, we mentioned that uh, during the previous uh, question session, uh, but it would be really interesting to know uh, what the shelter staff's responses is to this uh, model and and uh, this uh, in, from, in uh, just this part. Uh, all well, the the um, the stuff that we have been talking about is, is feeling that this is really really helpful uh, in the daily work with the children because uh, we have been educated all the staff at the center, so the staff sees like the children in the same way. So they react in the same way. They can help each other. Like, okay, now we see 
uh, he's acting out, we need to be calm, we need to meet him uh, in the way that we need to help. Or we see like, okay, this child needs to be, we need to help him in the connections with other peers because of our children, because he's acting out. How can we help that? How can we focus on this pillar? How can we make an iceberg? We had like one of the staff in like, our films was like, okay, let's make an iceberg. We just see the top, we see, just see the behavior. What has been this uh, child been through so we can understand much more so we can meet his needs in a, in a better way so they feel it's so big it's, it's been so good and also they said like the supervision uh, that they've been having for a long time has really really been helpful because then they could take like a child and talk uh, and tell tell me about the child and then they kind of like see okay what do we need to do to make him feel safe what do we need to make this child to to connect with other people and how can we make him cope with different kinds of stuff. Like usually they have hard time sleeping because usually they have nightmares and stuff and how can we help them in, in that way and stuff. So they feel it's been, they, they have been said it, it's really, really, really helpful for them. Yeah. And do you have any, um, any numbers on how many shelter staff that we have reached during these two, two past years? Yeah, we had like five shelters who has been with us like the whole project time. And then we have also educated uh, other shelters in the project as well. So I think we reach out to 97 yeah. sh shelter staff, something like that, uh, through our educations. And those educations are two days. So the, that's, uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, I think because we doesn't have any more questions uh, and feel free to stop me if you come up with one but otherwise I think that we will go on so I will uh, add my presentation here once again and I would just like to inform you all uh, a little bit what is happening now in the project and uh, so the model will be evaluated by Bana Frid, um, and this will be generated into a report that together with this working model will be available through barnafrid.se. And uh, during this autumn, Save the Children, as I said before, will run an advocacy campaign at local, regional, national and EU level. And all of the methods and models will continue to be available at each, each partner's um, websites as an ongoing work for children exposed to violence. We also have a, di a di digital conference uh, on the 15th of December. Uh, the conference will be in Swedish, but you are all free to join, but it might be a little bit hard, but but if, if you'd like to, it's, it's, uh, you're more than welcome. Um, and as one of the question was uh, a little bit earlier was if we have a website and yes, we do. So uh, you can scan uh, the QR code here and you will get directed to our websites. And if you have any, further if you want any further information about the project you can always contact me and if you have any other uh, questions regarding the puzzle piece trauma-informed care you can contact Sara. and before we sum up and uh, um, leave this webinar I would like you to answer a poll so I think that I will get some help with adding that. Yes. So please answer this uh, poll before we leave here today. And uh, uh, I would just like to say thank you so much for everyone that has participated here today and listened to me and Sara. 